Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I have a question for you. When you were younger, did you keep a diary? That's probably an old school term. Maybe I'm dating myself. A journal? Do they call it journaling now? Is that what they do? When I was a kid, I didn't because I was a boy. And boys don't do diaries. At least we didn't back then. But maybe you had a diary. Maybe it had a little locket thing on it. That's what my sister's diary had on it. Pretty easy workaround, though. <laughs> Not very good. Doesn't really work. I'll submit to you today that a diary can be a dangerous thing. You see, I heard a story of a teenage girl who kept a diary. Her life was rough. She did a lot of venting in her diary. She had a little brother who used to torture her. Our younger siblings do that sometimes, but she had a rough life. Her parents both worked. The mom sometimes second and third shift. The dad was either working or sleeping, so it seemed. And so she felt more like a mom than a big sister. One of the torture tactics that her brother would use, he'd hang the fact that she'd wear makeup to school over her head. So he'd say things like, if you don't let me stay up past my bedtime, I'll tell mom about the makeup. She wasn't supposed to do that, but she did. She would steal mom's makeup and then go to school. She would know about it because she's working. So he would hang this whole thing over her head and then she would vent about it in her diary or journal, say bad things about her kid brother. One day, when she was looking through her diary, she noticed a crumb. She brushed it off, continued journaling. The next day, another crumb. Mm, oatmeal raisin. Tasty. Well, you see, her brother wasn't squeaky clean either. He would make a habit of taking cookies from the cookie jar. You see, dad liked special oatmeal raisin cookies. And mom didn't want the kids eating them all day, so she kept it on the top of the refrigerator. Also, easy workaround for that. Push a chair right up next to the refrigerator and the boy would climb up high enough to get the cookies. Well, if you know anything about stealing from your parents, not condoning this, but just saying, done it, the key to stealing from your parents is to skim a little off the top. The little boy grabbed handfuls of cookies, so the mom was very suspicious, always asking him, are you eating all the cookies? And of course, he would lie and say no. She had no hard evidence, so nothing really happened. But the big sister put two and two together now. Okay, she thought. So one night, she completely complied with his request to stay up past his bedtime. Fine. So late that he passed out on the couch. So she went to her mom's room and got some lipstick and smeared a bunch on his forehead. He didn't notice. She woke him up just enough to get him to pass out in his bed. The next morning, the routine continues. Dad's sleeping in, mom's at work, so the big sister has to make breakfast and do all the momish type of things, get the kid ready for nothing, eating cookies. She went into the room, put mom's makeup on, goes to school. The little boy pushes the chair against the refrigerator, climbs up, grabs too many cookies, proceeds to his sister's room, opens up the diary or journal. Ooh, a new entry. Dear diary, I've been putting more and more of mom's makeup on lately. Got her in writing now. Let's keep reading. You see, ever since I ate one of dad's sacred cookies, I've been getting a horrible rash, so I've had to put more and more makeup on to cover it up. The little boy drops the cookie in the diary and runs to a mirror. And sure enough, there's a rash on his face. So he starts freaking out. Starts trying to cover, I, well, work for my sister, I'm gonna cover it up. But of course he looks like a clown because he has no makeup experience. So it's really, really bad. Then, poof, here's the door closed, the keys hit the end table. 
Uh-oh, mom's home. Runs down the stairs, and of course the mom notices it immediately. Have you been wearing my... That's where all my makeup is gone. You've been wearing my makeup during the day. No, mom, I ate dad's sacred cookies. So now, if we stop the message right here, what have we learned? How to steal from mom and dad and get away with it, and how to manipulate your younger sibling into confessing not only his truth, but yours. We'll keep going, right? Indeed, a diary is a dangerous thing. Today, we're going to continue in the rest of the story. Last week, we looked at the relationship between David and Jonathan. Jonathan is King Saul's son. They make a vow. They're very close, despite what Saul is doing to David. Then they part ways. Now we arrive this week in 1 Samuel chapter 21, starting at verse 1. David went to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he saw, saw him. He said, why are you alone? He asked. Why is no one with you? The king has sent me on a private matter, David said. He told me not to tell anyone why I am here. I have told my men where to meet me later. Now, what is there to eat? Give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. We don't have any regular bread, the, the priest replied, but there's the holy bread, which you can have if your young men have not slept with any women recently. Don't worry, David replied. I never allow my men to be with women when we are on a campaign. And since they stay clean, even on ordinary trips, how much more on this one? Since there was no other food available, the priest gave him the holy bread, the bread of the presence that was placed before the Lord in the tabernacle. It had just been replaced that day with fresh bread. So there is sacred food. <laughs> so here, David is clearly lying. He's being pursued by Saul. Saul has not sent him on any mission at all. So you see, there are consequences for this lie. He's elaborating on the story a lot. So he continues. He asks him, do you have a sword? Ahimelech says, ah, yes. There's the one that you used to kill Goliath with, Goliath's sword. Ah, I'll take it. There's nothing like it, he says. So he grabs the sword. He has provisions now. He's going to go on his way. But keep in mind, Doeg the Edomite is watching the whole time. Keep him in mind. So now David he flees to the Philistines in an ironic kind of reversal to King Achish of Gath. His officers don't like it. They know about David. Isn't this the guy they sing songs about? Saul killed his thousands and David killed his tens of thousands. This guy could be trouble, they're thinking. He could attack us. He's really the enemy still from the inside out. David hears about it. And he's worried. So what does he do? More deceit. He pretends to be crazy, spitting down his beard and stuff and scratching on doors, acting like a madman. So King Achish isn't really worried about him anymore. Get rid of this guy. We have enough crazy people here. So David flees. 1 Samuel 22, 1. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or in debt or were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. So he's got this band of outlaws with him. But he's worried about his mom and dad. He leaves them in Mitzvah of Moab to keep them safe. Then the prophet Gad warns David, leave the stronghold, go to Hereth. Meanwhile, cut scene. Saul's complaining near the Tamarisk tree in Gibeah to the men of Benjamin, has David offered you something to go against me? He's claiming that they're conspiring against him. So finally, Doeg the Edomite speaks up. He tells on David, ah, I saw Ahimelech give David provisions, the bread, the sword. Saul's mad about it. He calls for Ahimelech. Did you do this? Why are you conspiring on me? Ahimelech's like, whoa, he was the captain of your guard. What are you talking about? Are you allied with him? So everyone's kind of a little confused. David hasn't wronged you in any way, and I never wronged you in any way is the basic point of what he's saying. But Saul says, no, conspiracy. He orders them all killed. 
I'm going to die today. Well, his soldiers don't do it. They probably sense that it's pretty wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. But Doeg, you do it. Ah, Doeg the Edomite. Kills 85 priests, their families, everybody, even the kids, and their livestock in a tragic event. So indeed, David's lie had a serious price. Only Abiathar escapes. We'll talk about him a little later. Jesus mentions him at one point, if you know the Gospel of Mark. So Abiathar escapes to David, and he's the high priest there. And so David acknowledges his wrongdoing in the situation and takes him in. I'll protect you now. Doesn't really make up for it, but the least he can do. If we turn the page, we see again those pesky Philistines. They're raiding the town of Keilah. So David does something interesting. He consults with the Lord not once, but twice. Should I rescue Keilah? So we see a contrast between Saul and David here. So he does it. He rescues Keilah, defeats the Philistines. Mm, but now Saul hears about it. Ah, I've got him trapped in a walled town now. I'm going to get him. David gets wind of it. He has Abiathar with him with the ephod. This is how the priests would make decisions. They'd put this garment on, umum, thumum. They'd cast lots sometimes. So they asked the priest, will the people of Keilah betray me to Saul? Yes, the Lord says. He asks again. <laughs> Redundant, but wants to be sure. Yes. So, he escapes with 600 men. Remember, that was kind of a key number in the story. 600 men to the wilderness of Ziph. 1 Samuel 23, 15 says, One day near Horish, David received the news that Saul was on the way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you, as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. Then Jonathan returned home while David stayed at Horish. So remember last week, this is just a renewal of this pact. But the men of Ziph tell on David. Saul, being a great narcissist, says, finally, someone's concerned about me, pursues him. So David moves deeper and deeper into the wilderness while Saul keeps pursuing. So this kind of contrasting behavior until Saul now has to deal with the Philistines himself. But then it says, 1 Samuel 24, 1, after Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone to the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At the place where the road passes some sheepfold, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Now is your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David first kind of complies, but then he decides, I'm going to cut off the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience starts to bother him. I shouldn't have done that to the Lord's anointed one he thinks. So he waits for Saul to leave the cave, follows Saul out of the cave, and announces himself. The basic gist is, hey, look, I've got your robe. You were at my mercy, but I didn't kill the Lord's anointed one, he's saying, even if I could have. Then he says, and these are some key verses, let the Lord judge between us. He is my advocate, and he will rescue me from your power. Remember that. Important. Saul, is that you? You are a better man than me. You have repaid this evil with good. 1 Samuel 24, 20. Saul says, and now I realize that you are surely going to be king and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So David promised this to Saul with an oath. 
Then Saul went home, but David and his men went back to the stronghold. Now, if we turn the page, we see 1 Samuel 25, 1. Now, Samuel died, and all Israel gathered for his funeral. They buried him at his house in Ramah. Then David moved down to the wilderness of Maon. There was a wealthy man from Maon who owned property near the town of Carmel. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it was sheep sharing time. This man's name was Nabal, and his wife was Abigail. She was a sensible and beautiful woman, but Nabal, a descendant of Caleb, was crude and mean in all his dealings. So remember Carmel? That's the place where Saul set up the monument to himself. Kind of interesting. It's also interesting that they tell us that he's a descendant of Caleb, that is Nabal, one of the two people who didn't protest when they scouted out the promised land. They got to enter it, unlike all the other people their age, Joshua and Caleb. Now, Nabal, indeed, was kind of mean. David sends 10 servants. They come in peace. They just want provisions. We protected you, basically. We didn't do anything wrong to you. Come on, share some stuff with us. Nabal, no. He belittles David. He calls him a servant who has run away from his master, literally belittling him. And you guys are a bunch of outlaws. So they go back. They give David this report. (laughs) And David gets his sword and says, get your swords. We're going to go kill this guy. Meanwhile, a servant tells Abigail, a little smarter, this is going to be bad. So she saves the day. She gets a whole bunch of provisions together and approaches David. When she does, she bows down low to David and acknowledges it. Yes, he's a foolish man, as his name suggests. In Hebrew, sounds like folly or foolish. David's response, bless you for keeping me from murder. I was going to kill him if you didn't intervene. So she goes back home. Nabal, he's partying. He's getting drunk. So she doesn't tell him. She waits until he's hung over the next morning (laughs) to break the news, and he has a heart attack when he hears it. He's paralyzed for 10 days and then dies. Later, David finds out about it. He's like, well, would you marry me, Abigail? Nice guy, right? Give the husband a heart attack (laughs) and take his wife. It's a great way to get a beautiful woman. (laughs) It tells us here, David's wives are Ahinoam, Abigail, and Michael. Remember Michael? But it tells us that she is staying with Saul and marries him or her off to this guy named Palti. We're not going to talk about it today, but you can remember that for later. Something kind of interesting will happen with them. So even though Michael's married to David, Saul marries her to another man. If we turn the page, again, the Ziphites Turn on David. They tell on him. So Saul continues his pursuit. 3,000 men. But now they're camping out. And David and his friend Abishai spy on them. And so they're encamped in like a circular formation with Saul, Abner, his general, in the middle. There's a spear by his head and a water jug. And again, his men are like, oh, here's your chance. You can get Saul. No, I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed one. So another proof, like the hem of the robe. Let's just go down there and steal the spear and the water jug. Okay. So the Lord puts them in a deep sleep so they can get away with this. He gets a safe distance away. And again, another exchange like that. But this time he singles out Abner first. The general calls him out. Abner, you're such a wonderful general. You didn't protect your king. Sarcastic at first. I could have killed him, and so you should be killed for this. And now we have another exchange between David and Saul. David's making the point, what are you guys doing? I'm like a dead dog or a flea. Why do you keep coming after me like this? Where am I? What did I do? So 1 Samuel 26, 21, Saul confessed, I have sinned. Come back home, my son, and I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I've been a fool and very, very wrong. Here's your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you, even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now, may the Lord value my life, even as I have valued yours today. May he, God, rescue me from all my troubles. 
And Saul said to David, blessings on you, my son David. You will do many heroic deeds, and you will surely succeed. Then David went away, and Saul returned home. May the Lord rescue me from you. Key point. Trust in the Lord, and he continues to honor the king, even when the king is wrong. Now, David... He thinks Saul's going to keep coming. This is a pattern. So he has no reason to believe that Saul is going to keep his promise. So now, with the 600 men, he goes back to Achish of Geth. Interesting. Can I stay with you? This time, Achish lets him stay. Why? Well, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. David is going out on these raiding parties. He's not being entirely honest about who he's attacking. So when he's asked by Achish, where have you been? He's not so honest with him. He tells a half-truth. He's deceiving him. And so Achish is thinking, this is great. He's attacking all my enemies. Wonderful. He'll have to stay here forever. So again, David is deceiving. Now, most people are quick to point out that in these accounts, it seems as if there are two Saul's, right? Somebody called him at a Bible study, I think, a paranoid schizophrenic. That's what he seems like. He's constantly like two different people. And indeed, he has an evil spirit in him. It tells us that. Okay. But here, doesn't it also seem like there are two Davids? If we're being honest, we're usually really quick to jump to the account about him and Bathsheba. That's what we do, right? David sinned. He was a murderer and an adulterer. Back up. If we look at the rest of the story, he's doing a lot of sinning leading up to that, if we're being honest. Did you know David, a fairly troubled person, being persecuted? David kept a diary of sorts. I told you in the past that David wrote about half-ish of the Psalms. He's a musician, remember? A psalmist. And so he gives us a lot of the Psalms by the inspiration, of course, of the Holy Spirit. The Psalms are interesting because if you read them in full and you look carefully and you're reading the rest of the story, you can pair the Psalms of David, many of them, with these accounts. And we find one such pairing in Psalm 56. If we read the part of it that most people don't read, they're little intros sometimes, and it says this, for the choir director, a Psalm of David, regarding the time the Philistines seized him in Gath, to be sung to the tune, Dove on Distant Oaks. I don't know that tune. I don't think anybody does, but I have the words right here, so I'll read it to you and not sing it. Oh God, have mercy on me, for people are hounding me, My foes attack me all day long. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me, and many are boldly attacking me. But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? They're always twisting what I say. They spend their days plotting to harm me. They come together to spy on me watching my every step, eager to kill me. Don't let them get away with their wickedness. In your anger, O God, bring them down. But when I am afraid, I will trust in you, Lord. You will win the battles. So David published a diary of sorts. Guess he didn't mind people seeing it. And we too publish our diaries of sorts, sometimes online. You see, it seems like nowadays people don't mind letting other people in their diaries, or at least selective parts of our diaries, what we want people to read. You see, back in the day, I don't know about you, but usually what we had to say about someone else was confined to our diaries. We kept it there. I don't know 
about you, but it was usually just for the purpose of venting. My parents gave me some pretty good advice. Just think twice before you put anything in writing. You ever hear that? I've heard people say, don't put anything in writing. Why? Well, if you're guilty of something, people are going to use that against you. But haven't you ever said something or written something down in your diary and then said, I'm really glad I didn't send that email, that letter. I'm really glad I didn't say that. Nowadays, I think people have forgotten about this rule. It doesn't seem like people mind saying bad things about other people that everybody else can read. But here's the difference between David's diary and ours. For all his faults, and yes, he was dishonest, perhaps out of fear. I don't know. He acknowledges it. David isn't as dishonest and dishonoring as we are. In his diary, or the things he publishes, as some of us are today, David, think about it, for all his faults, just stop here, the obvious, he honored the king, even when the king was wrong. Quite respectful, actually, considering. He was dishonest at times, again, perhaps out of fear, but in his diary that he published, it's interesting to note, he's very honest about his fears, isn't he? Most of us are not. You see, we may do something wrong, like David did, but we're often not as honest about it. And we certainly don't always acknowledge our part in the situation, do we? Like David did. He confesses. You see, are we sharing faith like David in the Holy Spirit? Are we filled with that? If we are, then of course we would know. Judge a tree by its fruit. What kind of fruit? Well, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, self-control. We'd see more of that if we were sharing like David did in the Spirit sharing faith with others. However, that's not often what I see Christians sharing. I see many Christians sharing just the opposite, sharing anxiety, igniting fear, without leading people to faith. David, right? I'm afraid, but, 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 but the Lord's got it. That's where we'll end. Knowing our diary will be read are we using the opportunity to make Jesus known? That's the main thing. Or are we spreading fear? Are we leading people to comfort and peace that only the Lord can give? He is our strength. David, speaking by the Holy Spirit, you see, he's guided to praise the Lord and spread this hope, this peace, this strength that comes from the Lord. He's praising him. He doesn't stop at fear. He gets you to where we're supposed to be. He's honest about his struggle. He does his fair share of complaining if you read the Psalms. But he always gets you to the Lord. And I think that's the fundamental difference today. So we see kind of like a Psalm 56 formula, if you will. You see, David's honest. I'm afraid. He acknowledges it. Turns it around. But he doesn't stop at fear. He gets you to the Lord. So what does that look like today? What if we did that? I'm afraid. You see that post out there a lot? I'm afraid. You see, you learn something in pastor school and other places. You learn that anger is just a symptom of fear. That's why you're angry. You're afraid. And if we're being honest, we're all afraid of something. And that's why we get angry. I'm angry because I'm afraid, guys. Hey, guys, this really scares me. I'm afraid. I need to vent it out a little bit here. What if we were honest? No. Just the anger part. But then, but then, 
wait, I know, I just want to confess that, but there's the Lord. And man, I really trust that he's got it. He's going to sort all this out. We're fine, guys. So if you're afraid like me, just come on, let's, let's pray. Let's give it to the Lord. We want to pray for the best possible outcome. That's what we want, right? Whether it's illness, whether something's going wrong, whether it's some kind of governmental thing going on, we want to pray. Whether it's healing or whether it's some external thing coming in, do you know what the word God says we should do? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Read Romans 12. I'll give you some homework. Bless them. Do not curse. Do not. Ever. It doesn't say, but if da, 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 you don't agree with them politically, you can do it. No, it's not there. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Matthew 5, 44. Check my work. Romans 12. Again and again and again and again and again. This is what it says. Pray for kings so that we can have a peaceful life. Scream and yell at them and slander them so we can have a peaceful life, says it nowhere in the word of God. Pray for them, bless them so that we can live in peace. Maybe the Holy Spirit is just a little bit better than we are at changing people's minds. You think? Bless them. Pray for them. We need to give it to the Lord and look at the bigger picture. Consider this. 1 Peter 2, saying the same thing. Honor the emperor, or the king, some versions say. Probably maybe Nero at that time, who just happened to be burning Christians alive. Kind of rough, huh? Is that happening to us? No, not here in our cozy country. Not at all. But he says, even though this is happening, these fiery trials, as he calls them, it's a little later, but we're in chapter 2 now, honor them. Just honor them. And he goes through all these different people groups. Same thing. Slaves, even if your master is being cruel to you. First Peter 2, just keep reading. Go through, check my work. Work for them. Honor them like you'd honor the Lord. That's what Jesus says, right? Treat people like they're me, even the least of them. Interesting. Bless and honor them. This is really interesting. If we keep reading to the stuff that a lot of people don't read, you'll see 1 Peter 2, 21. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps, if you want. But if you don't want to, it's okay. No, does not say that. Verse 22, he never sinned nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. What? He did not retaliate when he was insulted. And now in case you're tempted to say, well, I'm not Jesus. It was different. You're missing the context. Go back. He is your example and you must follow his steps. And if we're being honest, we got it a lot easier than Jesus here, don't we? Yeah, just a little bit. So he did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. Okay, we are to be like Jesus. We are not to retaliate when insulted, but leave the case in the hands of God. We're called to be peacemakers sharing this message of faith, hope, and love. The crux of it is no matter what is going on in this crazy world we live in, it's always been crazy, we have hope. Jesus is going to come back and sort it all out. Are you believing that with me this morning? Do you believe that? When I reflect on that, and I really believe that, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Jesus will sort it all out. I find peace in that, and I want to share that peace with you. If you don't have peace, rest in the Lord. It's okay. Like the martyrs who were beheaded in Revelation. All right, they wake up. Ah, here's your white robes. Calm down. I got it. And he does. I've read it all the way to the end. He's got it. Do you believe that? It brings me great comfort, and I want to share it with you. Let me show you 
how this works practically. So contrary to popular belief, I work a few more hours than just now, right, on Sunday. Just a couple. And so during the week, I minister to people who have fears. They're afraid. It's the crux of it all. They're just afraid. And some have reason to be. So you've got to acknowledge that, right? Too many people, fear is faith in the enemy. That's not true. The Word of God says sometimes it's a really wise thing to be kind of afraid. <laughs> yeah, fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom. So you acknowledge that. A woman came up to me, approached me, or contacted me, I should say. She had a cancer diagnosis, late-stage cancer. It's a tough one. I hear too much. So, another one. Okay, here's what we're going to do. This stinks. It's no good. It's okay that you're afraid. That's the first thing. You're not in sin. It's okay. I get it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for the best immediate outcome possible. That's it. We're going to pray for that. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to believe that that's possible. We want you to be healed. Let's be calm about this. But it might surprise you to learn that that's not the goal. It's immediate. It's what's right here in front of us. But that's just a passing thing. It's not the goal. That's the goal, right? We're just like dust. So you got to remind people of that a little bit. But here's the important thing. And here's what we do about other situations when we publish it in our diary. And here's what you do not do if you're ministering to someone in this situation. You don't freak out about it, right? Oh no, what are we going to do? These doctors, blah, 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 and freak the person out entirely. We're not going to be short-sighted here. No. Calm down. Let's pray together. Let's hope. But look. We have the Lord. We can trust. That's where we're going. Then maybe let's go to Revelation a little bit and look at what Jesus is going to do. There are beheaded people in there. So what does he tell us? Go to the word on it. Ultimately, the healing is in our eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's it. We're not going to worry about the immediate. And I want to share some scripture with you as I close this morning. And I want you to think about something. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, a couple of different issues are going on there. They're dragging their feet on a collection that's supposed to go to the church in Jerusalem. The other one is false teachers. Yes, Paul and Timothy are dealing with false teachers. I get it. And so they're spreading a lot of false things. And so what they have to do is bolster their ministry. They have to explain all the trials that they're going through and that these false teachers, they're not the real deal because they're not willing to go through all the hard stuff. That's the backdrop. They even say, 2 Corinthians 7, we have fears within. They're acknowledging, they're afraid. It's bad. But check this out. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Though through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. That's interesting. It's Psalm 116, starting at verse 10. If you keep reading the rest of Psalm 116, it says, I am deeply troubled, Lord. In my anxiety, I cried out to you. These people are all liars. So that's in the mind of someone who knows the word of God as they hear this from the apostle. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't, that is, we do not 
look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. That's the goal. Are we living in fear of the things that will soon be gone? Or are we living in faith in the things that will last forever? We're commanded to be peacemakers. And if you came here today looking for peace, if you have fears, if you have anxieties, if you have anger, the peace is here. The peace is in Jesus Christ. So I get it. Yep, there's a lot to be angry about, isn't there? A lot of crazy stuff in the world. But hear this. Jesus has overcome the world. And in him, and only in him, we find a peace that surpasses all understanding. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, for these people being willing, even on a holiday weekend, to come in and celebrate your resurrection, to give all the glory to you, to praise you, Lord, to put you above all else. And so that is what I pray. That as we go out, we are vessels of peace, hope, and love to everyone we see with our main intention and goal. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can do this in this difficult world to spread the knowledge of the good news, to share you with others. I ask this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.